do have a video for you guys. I'm not going to play it quite yet. Um, from the word that was shared this morning, from what the Lord's been speaking to me about since yesterday. Okay. Yes, since yesterday. That's when I got the call about five o'clock that I was preaching today. But it doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't move. It doesn't mean that we don't have his word that we don't learn from. But there are other ways that encourage us and strengthen us as a church body. And that's by sharing testimonies. That's by hearing what God has done in other people's lives. Okay. Most of your Old Testament, okay, let's just be honest, is what God has done through different people's lives, through the kingdom of Israel. And that's why they wrote them down, because they wanted to be able to give us something to be able to say, this is what my God did. That's why they built altar, altars and said, here's what God did here. This is a remembrance of it. That's why we take communion on church on Sunday, to remember Christ's sacrifice, to remember his resurrection to remember what he did and what he paid for and how he paid for it. Because if we don't remember it, we already know what happens, okay? We, we really do. We can read that through the Old Testament. We can read what happens when generations after generations, and they forget about the goodness of God and what they did when God freed the Israelites multiple, multiple times, and they forget about who he is. They forget about his strength. They forget about his love. They forget about why they worshiped him. And a lot of times they turned away. And so this morning we have a testimony that's going to be shared from one of our very own. Blessing, if you would come up, please. She's going to share her and her husband's story of something that they've gone through recently. Uh, and it's a powerful testimony. I'm going to let her share it this morning. Hi, church. Um, my name is Blessing, like everybody knows. Um, and I have three kids. They are upstairs with the children. Um, so I'm here this morning. My husband would have loved to be here with me, but he's still recovering. But first, before I say what God has done in our life, I want to thank this church for being the family that we do not have here in Casper. This church has been really supportive, um, going from the prayer team to the um, worship team to the pastors They've been there all through the way, and God has used the prayers of this church, of your prayer. He has used your prayers to work wonders in my husband's life, and so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all you've done, and so um, that just brings me up. Um, it's been a journey so far since December um, when my, my husband uh, got back from work one night, and had a complaint about his back, lower back. And I thought it was one of those days that he will come back and complain, I'm tired, and I'm like, oh, okay, let's just do this. And so, yeah, he complained, and I we did what we could do that night, and he got to bed. The next morning, he was unable to get out of bed, and he could not even get his foot, one leg out, nothing. And so this journey started since December the 3rd, and we visited so many doctors. They came up with all kinds of things from bulging disc, you know, to everything, everything. At some point, um, he was um, diagnosed of um, bone marrow cancer. And um, he didn't tell me when he got the res result. Uh, what happened is I went to work, and he waited until I got back home. And I asked him, what is the result? Have they called you yet? And he said, yes. But then the look on his, fur, uh, on his face was, you know, really disturbing. And so when he told me, the first thing that I told him is, that is not God's report for you. And I stepped away from him, went into the room, and just knelt down. Partly, I was crying. The other time, the other part, I was praying. Also, I was very afraid. And so um, I stood up. I said, who do I call? I didn't want to call my parents back in Nigeria because then that would really um, scare them. So I called Pastor Greg. I said, this is what they said about my husband, but I believe that's not God's report for him. And he said, can I pray with you? And I said, yes, of course. Um, that's the only thing I'm hanging on to now, prayers. And so he prayed for us. 
And after he prayed, um, the CT result was sent over to the oncologist, Rocky Mountain Oncology. And this doctor gave us a call and said, I want to see you. So we went in, and the doctor, um, you know, said, yes, they said, you have, you know, you have cancer. But for me, I want to know what cancer you have before we start anything, even though the CT says you will need transplant. And so um, he did a biopsy on my husband and said, 10 days. We were going to get the results 10 days later. So within this time that we were waiting for results, a lot was happening. He was depreciating. He got to a point that if you look at him, he, he looked different from who he is. And so we just kept praying, just holding on to the word. Um, we prayed like never before. And I told God, I said, this is what you said about my husband in your word. I kept hanging. And, and what I did, most of the times I will look at the Bible, whatever word I hear, I will put his name, my husband's name, on a verse and prayed it over him. And I kept that going. I tell God, I will keep doing what I can do for you. And I will see what you would do in return for me. It's not that I would do it perfect, but I would try. And so I kept coming to church. Um, I will get scheduled to be on the, t on the team, worship team. I will come in. But just the whole thing kept going, and we just kept going. And on the 10th day, the doctor called and said, um, your result is out. And you know what? I don't know what is happening. I need you in my office. There's nothing in your husband's blood. There is no bone marrow cancer. And I said, yeah, okay, that's the report we need. Yes, God is good. And so we went in, and he was baffled that for a fact there was something that they saw in his blood that made them recommend a transplant. And for the fact that it's not there, that I, he is really confused. Um, and then the doctor said, who, who do I call? Should I call the a radiologist and ask them why the difference and what is happening. I said, no, don't call because there is who is it, who is in charge of the medical and God is in charge and he has done what no man can do. And so God reversed the, the story, the, the report of cancer for my husband. The battle did not end there. Okay, when the enemy sees that God is working things for you, he will try to sneaking deceive you or confuse you and so what happened is we thought okay there's no cancer we're just working on this we're gonna get the back fix and all that well it did not go that way because what i propose what man proposes is not what god proposes you know and so the battle kept going and we kept dealing with pains a lot of things happening, lose of blood and all of that. And at the end of the day, um, the doctor, uh, the oncologist said, well, I did my part of trying to find what cancer. There's no cancer. This is where I would have stopped. But I am curious to what is happening to your husband. I'm going to go ahead and order some more testing for him. And so he put in test and more MRIs, about five MRIs. And this is for someone that cannot stand, stand up straight or lay down straight or anything. So we were worried about going into the MRI, but then we just asked God, take charge. I always call Pastor Greg. I say, Pastor Greg, this is what is happening now. The cancer is gone, but there's another thing we are dealing with now. And he prayed. And the team prayed, and everyone was praying. Everyone around was lifting him up. So we went in and got three MRIs in one day. We couldn't do the five. So three MRIs came out. The next day we were supposed to go in for the final two. And when we went, uh, we were getting ready. We got a call from the oncologist. And he said, we found something in one of the MRIs. Would you take your husband immediately to the ER? And we got ready and got up. I took the kids with me. We went to ER. We got to ER. We got there before the referral actually came through. So ER were like, what is happening? And we started telling the story all over again. But um, in that period, 
I, I was just, you know, thinking through. I said, what's going to happen? What is the worst? I mean, the worst has, you know, it's gone. The cancer was my worst fear. I said, at this age, if he, anything like this happens, what's going to happen to the kids? And so we got the ER. They started taking care of him, treating him. And then um, they said, we can't let him go. We were too worried. He we cannot let him go tonight. We're going to have to admit him. So he was admitted here in Casper, um, Banna Health. We were there for a few days, and then we had so many team came in. We had the spine doctors coming in, and the infectious disease, everything, everything you can think of, they came through. And then um, the infectious disease doctor said something, said, you know, there's something in his spine, and I think we can treat it. After he said that, the next doctor came in, no, we found something and it's very dangerous and I don't think we can, you know, handle it here. And so it came to a point where they, they did a, an echo of his heart. Sorry, I'm trying to cut it short. But they did the echo of his heart and his heart was not doing well. And the doctor said, um, this is what I think it is. And uh, he's going to need, um, you know, surgery. And so we were, I called Pastor Craig and the team, I let the team know that, okay, this is where we're at. This is what they found. So what happened is um, a surgeon came in and said, okay, we're going to do this in Casper. But God placed a nurse that stood up and told us and asked us to talk to the doctor that that cannot be handled in Casper, Wyoming, that it has to be taken to a bigger facility. And so she left the room, followed the surgeon to talk to him, but the surgeon didn't say a word to her and did not tell us if he's going to refer or not. Long story short, um, he didn't come back again. Um, he sent the uh, hospitalist the next morning to tell us that he's referring us to either Utah or um, Colorado, UCH. So um, I asked them, when do you think we're leaving? How much time do we need to get ready? And he said, well, I don't think you're leaving today, but I think in a few days, give it a couple of days. I left the hospital, went to my work to report and drop off some things. And within two hours, I got another call saying he's leaving in 30 minutes. Um, he's been accepted in the UCH and he's got to go in three minutes, uh, 30 minutes. And so I called Pastor Craig and said, I have only 30 minutes to decide if I'm going to go with my husband or stay home with the kids, I don't know what to do. Can you meet me at the hospital? And so within that 30 minutes, Pastor Craig was there, and the, the EMT, EMT were getting him ready to go. So we stood there, and I tried to talk to my husband to let me go with him, uh, that the kids will be taken care of by, you know, friends and families. And he goes, Oh, so who's going to take them? Just let them be here. I did not know what was on his mind. My husband did not think he was going to come out of it, and he wanted me to be around for the kids. So I told him, no, we're going to go together because we will go and we will be back to the kids together. And that's what God has designed. He did not design for you to die young. And this is what God has decreed upon your life. I read him a word, and we were talking, and then he goes, Okay, I think we can uh, we can both go. So we yeah we flew down to UCH. They got him um, all admitted and all that. And the surgeon came in and talked to him and gave him the options of what they're gonna do for him. This is where God showed up. We've been praying and praying and waiting and hoping and believing. I hear God talk to me and through his words and through, you know, encouragement from people. But at that, on that day, the night before the surgery morning, um, I was talking to my husband, and he told me to stop talking to me, to him. So I stopped and stepped away from him. I sat on a, on a, on a couch, a sofa, away from him. So he drifted into a very short nap. And as he was sleeping, I looked in my phone. I was trying to find something to, like, tell him, encourage him that it's going to be okay. And from where I was looking at my phone, he said something. 
he just came out of the sleep screaming, is that your hand? And I ran to him. I said, what hand? What are you talking about? And he said, while I was sleeping, I saw a hand, a very huge hand, go from my head, hovering over my head to my belly, from top to bottom of my belly. And it kept waving and waving. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yes. I said, you know what just happened to you? You asked a question why God did not take away this pain from you, why you had to go through. And God just came through and show you that he is here with you and that he's going to take you through it all. And that is God's hand that was over you, just showing you that he is always, always present with you. And I got like covered in goosebumps. I said, yes, the spirit of the Lord knew that I did not have a word for you anymore. But he showed up in time and on time. And church, I just want to let you know that God is never late. He is always, always on time. It might not be at your own time. It might not be on your own watch, but he is never late. This was a night before the surgery. And in the morning, he got into surgery, about 10 hours surgery, and came out with hardly no complication. Today, he is recovering and doing well. I just want to let you know, whatever you're going through, hang on to God. Pray. Don't stop praying because God hears prayers. He might not be immediately when you're looking for, but he will definitely come through. And one of the Bible verses that I put my husband's name over and prayed for him is Psalms 6 verse 2. It says, have mercy on me, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal, him, heal me, for my bones are are troubled. And that was what I prayed over my husband every day. I said, he is weak. The Bible says that you are our strength in time of our weakness. You are our hope when we're hopeless. And uh, I kept pushing on and just holding on to the word that God will always, always show up. It might not be where I can see. I might not see it. You might not see it. But church, I just want to encourage you. If you have anything that is troubling you, that you're going through, whether you share it with people or not just within you, hang on. God will show up for you. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, that makes me excited, church. Uh, I hope that makes you excited here today. Even if you've got nothing going on, even if you don't have a hardship yourself, right, there's no reason why you can't be excited about what God's doing and the people next to you and the people around you. Even though you may not even have heard of what was going on, I, I, can, I can tell you God wants to do some stuff. God, God's not done. Sure, they had to have two miracles, Right. But the, the biggest thing that I'm going to continue to build upon of what blessing shared was something she said in the very beginning. And it was the fact that she said, we prayed like we never prayed before. Guys, she she changed it up. She's consistent in her prayer in her walk in her reading. But in order to get through this, she had to change it up a little bit. OK, and, and there's reasons why sometimes we got to change it up and that's OK. And, I, and I'm going to share with you because that's the title of the message today is to change it up. I don't have any slides for you guys, but we are going to be in Matthew chapter seven. If you want to be able to turn to there in your own Bibles and your own phones, we're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter seven for a bit. And while you look for it, I've got a, just a fun little video. OK, just to be able to help make you laugh something from when I was a child. Uh, just a vi little video clip, just talking a little bit about changing it up, okay, and sometimes how it looks. Go ahead and roll the video for me real quick.
to say, I'm sorry, but without a coach behind the bench, you're four for the game. But you can't do that. Yeah. 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 We have one. Miss McKay! Hey, Charlie, what's up? You have to pretend you're a coach. You would forfeit the game. Where's Coach Bombay? Pretend or we're out of the tournament. But I don't know anything about coaching. <laughs> Here she is, our coach, Coach McKay. Center ice, Germany wins the draw. Comes across the Team USA blue line. Germany on the right wing side. Down to Big Boss Tobias. Right down the middle. He shoots and a save by Goldberg. Great save by Goldberg as Germany is really throwing their weight around. Uh, we look tired. We need to trade places. What? Uh, new players. Oh, say change it up. Right. Change it up. Scream it. Change it up! <laughs> late in the period with a face-off coming up at center ice. <laughs> That's a fun little video from my childhood, Mighty Ducks 2, if you've never seen it. It's old school. But um, when I was praying last night, and I, was, and I was talking to God, and he gave me Matthew chapter 7, referring to, chap to verse 7, where he talks about ask, seek, and knock. And he told me, change it up. And this scene came to my mind, okay? And I haven't seen this video in like 15 years, okay? Uh, it's been a long time. But when, when you get tired, okay, when you get exhausted, when you don't have anything left, sometimes you have to be able to change it up. The problem is, is that there's a lot of people in life and they get stuck in a cycle. They do the same thing over and over, because for the most part, it's working. It mostly works. It gets them through the day. Um, and that's just kind of how it is. They're afraid to be able to change things up. They're afraid that if they do something different and it fails, then they're just going to completely fail. They're going to fall off. They're not going to be able to make it, that they've got nothing left in the tank. That if they change it up and it fails, then they've got nothing left. And it's over. Okay? And they're just trying not to panic. Because they know if they change something, they're going to panic. And I know what that's like. I do. In many different cases. From being a wrestler to playing football to being in school to being in college. Sometimes you don't know what's next. I used to run cross country. And something I had a really bad habit of was just looking down. Okay? Now, if you're a runner, okay, if you know anything about running... You're not supposed to look down at your feet while you run, always, okay? Are there moments where you're going to have to because you're coming across rocks and rough terrain and you need to look down to make sure you don't trip, you don't fall, you don't hit it weird, you don't sprain your ankle, you don't break your leg, whatever it is. There are moments where you got to look down, okay? A couple weeks ago, I went up to the cross, up to the hill over here, if you have guys have ever seen it. If you come look out our property, you walk out the doors, you look up slightly to the right, there's a cross up on that hill. Now, it doesn't look that bad. You look at it, you're like, oh, I could walk that up. So you got to walk up it, okay? It's like a sand dune, okay, if you've ever been to one of those. And I decided to go for a walk, and I was just listening to music, listening to the Exile album by Crowder, and we're going, and I'm praying, and I'm worshiping, and I'm... I'm like trying to make sure I don't just look down because I still have a tendency to do that when I go for long walks. When I go for runs, I just look down because I'm worried about what's next. But the problem is, and the trouble that I sometimes have, is that I'm not looking forward enough so I can plan out the best course that I have to do. So sometimes, now, right, I have to stop. When I was going up the hill, I had to stop and look I look down, okay, I've got this over here, I've got a cactus that looks super tiny, but it's about to kill me if I fall on it, and okay, I should not go left, I need to go right. I would have tried to go straight up, and that would have been also difficult as much as it would have been going to the left, and instead, I looked up and I realized I need to deviate my course, and I need to go to the right. 
I need to change it up than what I originally thought. Because now that I'm closer to the end goal, I can see something and I can see the fact that it gets a little bit more difficult as we continue on. While God does not change, our God is not changing, and he gives us his word to be able to know and understand who he is. So that way we know who he is when he is. So there are certain things that don't change about God, and God does not change. Okay, God is God, but he doesn't always do things the same way for us. Why, you might ask? Because he's made each of us individually. He's made each of us different. We all come from different backgrounds, from different lives, from different stories. And so God speaks to us differently. And that's okay. Because he wants you to know that he's speaking to you. And so one way we do that is to ask, much like Blessing did. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this, and we're going to read a, a few verses here. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, uh, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Guys, I'm here to tell you today that no matter what you're going through, no matter the struggle, even if you don't have one, okay, there are ways to be able to change it up. There are three ways that we get to know God, that we grow, grow, cl grow closer to him, okay? There are three ways, three main simple things that pastors talk about all the time, and the youth get tired of me, of me saying it, and it's you guys need to pray more. You need to read your word more, and especially when I say that. They're like, but I hate reading books. Yeah, 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 okay? And then the third one is worship, okay? There are three ways we grow closer to God, but we don't have to do them the same way every single time. I'm going to share an example of someone who I just talked about yesterday during men's breakfast with, with Seth Ditterkoff, his dad who recently passed away, Dale. I think about him all the time because of the way that he lived his life, the example that he was. And he was, and it was so great because he's never changing. You see these altars over here that we have on the both sides? He built those. You want to know what's even great about him? And I've shared this a couple times before. Dale was the kind of person when he was in need of God's presence, when he was in need of God, you want to know what he would do? If there was a, a, any chance that he was going to be 10 minutes out of the way of coming to the church, he would. Many times he would show up, and even in the darkness of it, he wouldn't turn a light on. He didn't care. And he'd kneel at these altars, and he'd pray. Even if it was for 30 seconds, I've seen this man. I've seen him come in for five minutes just to be able to say, and sometimes I've seen him wearied. I'd seen him tired coming in. Other times I'd seen him come in, and he's like, I just need a little extra recharge. And then he's trying to play a prank on me, and he's turning my lights off in my office because I didn't know he came in. Okay? Um, that was, that was Dale. You want to know what else Dale did? He didn't just ask differently from God. He had his thing that he did every single morning, right? But when he was in need, he'd come over here to the church. And if he couldn't do that, he'd go out somewhere where he could, out to his field with his cows. You want to know how he read the word differently? Every year he read through the Bible, almost every year he read through the Bible but he'd do it in a different translation just to see if there was something a little extra that he could learn from it, something extra that he could understand from it. And he'd have his notes and he'd have that Bible always with him and in his car and everywhere he went. He did that. It was great. Those were two of the main things that Dale did to be able to grow closer to God, to grow, grow, to grow better in his faith. And he was consistent with it. 
But in moments of need, he continued to be the same man that he was. Because even up until the end, I'd go in there and I'd see him in the hospital when he was very sick, and he'd still ask to pray for me. He never stopped being who he was just because times got tough. You need to continue to be the same person that you are, even when times are tough. And it's okay to be able to change it up. Okay? And trust me, I get it. In times of need, when you need to be able to change it up, and you need to be able to cry out to God instead of in your normal prayer, say, God, I need you to do something in my life. Sometimes you need to get over here to the altar, and you need to get on your hands and knees, and you need to say, God, I need you today. God tells us in his own word about the widow who wanted justice. And he's like, you want to know, this is Jesus' own parable. And he says, you want to know what the widow did? She annoyed and she kept going after the judge. Even though the judge would not give her justice, she annoyed until she got justice. And God says, and sometimes you need to be that way. Sometimes you need to be a little persistent in your prayer, in your asking of God, because it says, Those who ask, receive. And those who seek, find. I find it interesting that our our theme for the year is pursue His presence. It means for the entire year, not just for a month, not just for two months, not just for a little bit, because you go through a hard time. You want to know why? Because for those of you who maybe don't have a lot going on, God wants to use you to speak into other people's lives, to help those that are around you. Because there are going to be others like Blessing and her family who need you to be able to do a little extra work and maybe go help them physically, not even just in prayer, where you can help them mow their lawn, help watch the kids, help do something, help take the weight off. Because sometimes that's what God asks you to be able to do. Because just right here in verse 12, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, it's our golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. For, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I want you guys to be part of the few that enter through the narrow gate. And so I'm asking you today to change it up. Will you today, instead of sitting down for worship, would you stand? For those of you that always sit in the same seats, are you willing to sit in a different seat and change it up? Let yourself feel a little uncomfortable because you already do feel uncomfortable. I'm telling you it's okay to be able to worship God and put a little pep in your step when God's doing something good in your life for you to be able to show it. Talked a little bit about that last week. Do you know yourself well enough to be able to say, I know what I need to be able to do to have more of God in my life? Just like I know I need lots of worship in my life. I need lots of music in my life that's godly music that keeps me going. Do you know enough about yourself to say this is what I need almost every single day, that I need a little bit more of to be able to keep me going. Because if you ask Pastor Craig, me and him are very different, okay? Pastor Craig is way more analytical. He's super organized. And you want to know what keeps him strong in his faith? It's the answers that he's gotten from the questions that he has had about God, okay? If you ask him that question, that's what he's going to tell you, because I've asked him multiple times. And he shared it with the youth. He shared it with the young adults before. And he's like, it's the answers to the questions that I've got. Because when he was back in college, and he had all these questions and things he didn't understand, and he went looking for the questions, and he prayed about them, and he read the Word, and he did all the things, and he got the answer to the questions. I don't generally have as many questions. I'm a little bit more simple, okay? I do need my, my things, absolutely. But God speaking to my heart does enough for me just for the fact that when I remember when I got saved, I was bawling my eyes out and I don't cry a lot. Was the moment 
that God did something great in my life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27 says this, and I want you guys to hear this this morning. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Verse 28 and 29, I'm just going to read the end of this. And it says, And then Jesus finished these sayings. The crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Sam Stevens, would you come up this morning for me? I know today seems a little short because today what I want you to do, one thing I'm asking of you guys today if you're here, you say you're, you're a Christian, no matter where you're at in your life, no matter where you're at in your walk, no matter what's going on, I want you to pursue God, this last little bit left of church. I want you to pursue him just a little bit different. I'm asking you to change it up. Because I believe God wants to do something. He wants to continue to do something. Do you come expecting When you come to church on Sundays, do you come expecting God to do something in your life? God to do something in someone else's life? Or are you like many of the students who wait for God to just do something? For something to get to the point of its end and be like, well, I guess now I've got to do something about it because I've got no other options. Are you like those youth kids who are about to go to camp who have had gone to all of these youth services and all of these other things and have all, all of these opportunities to talk to their leaders and their pastors and their friends and their families and their parents about all these issues that they've got, but instead they wait for camp to solve them. Because they only believe, it seems, at least the way that their faith works, is that God can only really move at camp. God can only really move at youth convention. But I'm here to tell you today that He can move right here in this room. He can move in your rooms, at home, when you're outside in the fields, when you're outside just in a parking lot, while you're running, while whatever it is that you do, God can speak to you and he can move because he wants to. You can pursue his presence anywhere you go. You can be at the gym pursuing God while you lift weights, while you run, even while you eat a donut. I really need you guys to hear today. I just want you guys to hear that God can do it. That he's got it. And just like with Blessing and Linus, he's just asking you to trust him with it. It might take time. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. I was, I'm going to share this one last story with you guys. And it's a testimony from someone I was watching online. And he's a, he's a high school professor, or he's a college professor. He's a Christian. And he doesn't teach at a Christian college. He teaches at a secular college, okay? And he says, you know, over the years, I generally, when I, I help students move in, if they need help, I physically help them and all these things on move-in day and all these things. I do all this because I want to be able to reach them. I want to be able to talk to them. And he said, I decided to change it up. And instead of asking them about Christ and trying to speak Christ into them, I told God the day before, and he's like, I, God, I want, to, I want someone to come ask me about Christ. I want someone to ask me about you. I'm not going to do this this time. I'm not going to force myself upon them in my faith. I want someone to come to me and hear about Christ at least by the end of the day. So he helps all these kids move in. It's past five o'clock. There's nobody left. And he doesn't know what to do. He's discouraged. He's, he's, he's sad. And they've got a little pond, a little lake 
they call it a lake, I call it a pond. It's not no lake, but whatever. And they've got little walking paths for the students and all these things. And it's 11.55 at night. And he's walking them and he's even more discouraged. It's the end of the day. There's five minutes left. And he just starts singing about God. And he lays on a bench. 11.59 rolls around, looks at his watch. And he sits up. And someone about 15 feet in front of him, over to the side on the path, he's crying. And he said, I came here today to take my own life. And I heard you singing about the goodness of God. Can you tell me about him? At 11.59, all because he had to put a time limit on it, okay? He's just telling you, you put time limits on things, God's like, okay. I'll wait till the last minute for you. I'll prove to you that I heard you. But I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to learn, I'm going to teach you about what patience is. I'm going to teach you about what endurance is. I'm going to grow your faith to the point that the next thing that shows up in your life, it's not a problem because you've already been built up because you've already had the foundation like no other. And that's Christ and Christ crucified. I, I know I feel like a broken record, guys. But some of you guys are in a place where you need to change it up. Some of you need to get out of your seats this morning and you need to come down and you're going to have to ask for, for prayer. Some of you are going to have to get out of your seats because you've been there so long and you might need to come up for worship. We make students do it for camp. Make students do it for convention. We make them do it upstairs. And I'm here to challenge you today to do something a little bit different with your life. Do something a little bit different with your worship, with your prayer. I want you to have consistency, trust me. I'm not saying don't have consistency in your walk with Christ. That's not what I'm saying. Don't get it twisted. But I'm saying, why not, why not deal with the issue now? Why do the same thing? Why wait? You might be like, Zach, I've already done it all. Have you? Because if I don't know about it, then you ain't done it all. You ain't talked to me about it. I mean, if you talk to Pastor Craig, great. Okay, he's the lead pastor. Talk to him. All right. But I'm telling you, God wants to do some great things in many of your guys' lives. I'm going to ask the prayer team to already come on up just a little bit early for me. I don't want to ask a question today to many of you. Maybe you're sitting here saying, I've got a lot going on, but I don't, I don't know this Christ that you speak of. I don't know this God that you talk about. But maybe you want to today. Maybe you want to know him. Maybe you're willing to be able to give him an opportunity because you've got no other opportunities left. So if, if all of you would, just out of respect for one another, would you guys bow your head and close your eyes this morning? Our prayer team is going to come up here early. The worship team, if you guys would. I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to ask it again. Just everyone's head bowed, every eyes closed, out of respect for one another. That's all this is. That's the only reason why we do this. That's the only reason why I ask it is for respect. For the person next to you, for the person who doesn't yet know Christ, if they want to, to give them that opportunity. If you're here today and you say, I need Christ in my life. I need him to do something. Would you raise your hand this morning? If you need to accept Christ for the first time in your life, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. If you're going to say, I'm going to give it over to God, and I'm going to give him over my issues, I'm going to give him over my life, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what he has to say, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to trust. Thank you. I see your hand. Would everybody here with me pray this prayer together. No one praying alone, please. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. I accept your free gift of love and salvation. I give you my life. Change me. Help me. Guide me. Show me who you are today. I give it all to you. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.